Ah, okay. All right. So today is the last lecture uh, uh, for the gravitational wave uh, course. So, do you have any questions so far in the last previous two lectures? You can either write in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, okay. So today's lecture will be uh, uh, more about uh, what is in the future of gravitational wave astronomy. Um, so let's get started. So in the in the last two lectures, I hope I can I was uh, able to give you some idea that we have essentially started the field of gravitational wave astronomy, and we have done some basic uh, sciences. Even though they there are significant breakthroughs, especially after the uh, detection of uh, uh, the binary neutron stars, we learned so many things uh, at the same time. Uh, after the and uh, of course the detection of the black hole was a major thing uh, anyway so all those things are there but then this is still the beginning of uh, gravitational wave uh, astronomy and there, there is a long way to go so what are the possible signs that we could do with it so i already mentioned in the last lecture the possible uh, science potential of the uh, of this new field but here are some, uh, again, just to uh, recap. Uh, so uh, compact binary evolution and population. And so you have detected 50 sources. That is not enough to get the population. You need hundreds of sources to see how they are distributed uh, in redshift, uh, that is in the universe, how they are, uh, how they are uh, created, how these binaries are created. Um, that will tell us more about the history of the universe overall. Uh, and all those things are there. Uh, okay, so there is a, okay, I'll come to the question later on. Uh, then we have only detected stellar mass sort of, uh, let's say up to tens of solar mass uh, binaries. There are, uh, the, the black holes exist in a very large uh, spectrum uh, of masses. Uh, it's, it's up to, uh, 10 to the 9 solar masses, then there are intermediate uh, mass black holes in between. So all those things are remaining. Then we have to, we have some idea about the uh, neutron stars, what they are, they are contained, equation of state, etc. But a large number of uh, observations will be necessary to actually uh, say it concretely, even though the GW17817, that binary neutron star source, already ruled out some of the uh, uh, parameters which would be otherwise allowed, or in other words, uh, some of the uh, equation of states which could be allowed uh, uh, for neutron stars. So we have a lot of progress, but a lot more to be to uh, is remaining in order to uh, find exact uh, uh, to get the exact understanding of how things work. Then in cosmology, as I said, the, the measurements, uh, the starting from the Hubble constant, there is a problem. We need to get the Hubble constant uh, measurement uh, right first. And then uh, there is dark energy inflation. So for dark, if there is how, if dark energy evolves and so on. So all those things can be uh, done by precise measurement of the Hubble parameter versus redshift. Uh, where gravitational waves uh, astronomy can play a significant role uh, by observing the uh, binaries, distant binaries, uh, because there is a natural uh, uh, sort of calibration. We can measure both the phase and the amplitude and they give uh, diff, uh, complementary information. We could uh, get uh, more out of it. Uh, then there, are, uh, there is, a, and of course we can combine with uh, electromagnetic follow-up whenever possible. Then the inflationary background, which may be depicted at some point, uh, the inflationary gravitational wave background. So in cosmology also, there is a lot of things to do. Then there is fundamental physics that whether gravitation, general relativity is the ultimate theory of gravitation and so on. We discussed this uh, last time. 
so dark energy equation of steroids is related to the uh, distance measurement neutron star equation so these are fundamental physics questions so all those things are there and finally last but not the least surprises every astronomy when we started the lectures i showed that you know there are the, that uh, from after galileo in the next 400 years we got very precise picture of the universe but on the other hand uh, there were a lot of surprises which completely changed the way we look at the universe and we, we there maybe there will be uh, some surprises also with gravitational wave astronomy it actually started with surprises in the sense that the expected uh, masses of black holes which we would be detecting would be few solar masses but it turned out that there are a lot more uh, tens of solar masses black holes than we actually expected so clearly there is already a shift and that was uh, i think if you remember this picture yesterday see these were the kind of black holes which were expected these purple ones but then what we detected are much heavier so already there is there are uh, surprises here involved and this is another surprise there was nothing detected in this so called mass gap and then we know that there is something there now because these two merged to form some uh, something of this mass so this is how it is so there is there are already surprises but then there may be surprises even bigger surprises of something which is completely unexpected which is uh, which we discover and so on but that would require uh, a lot of things that detectors have to be sensitive enough so that we can see these kind of signals uh, uh, with uh, very uh, uh, high so what is called the signal to noise ratio that is very loud signals we have to see and then we have to understand the detector very well and we have to have very smart data analysis technique so that we can confidently say that this is not noise this is actually a signal from some unknown source so and all those things probably will take the next few years to decades uh, to develop okay so he, now i will go to the question and then move forward as the gravity tells time how to behave and time tells gravity to vice versa so gw also produces distortion in time dimension i mean well space time uh, so the question is that whether gravitational waves also change time so the thing is that it is space time are sort of together in relativity so you can uh, see it uh, in a different way also you can certainly uh, transform the uh, that these distortions to a time like uh, time uh, coordinate distortion and so on so but then they are together i mean generally we uh, use the uh, something ha huh, one thing i forgot to say that you know when we were doing this calculations etc we were using this transverse stressless gauge which is a specific coordinate system now one could ask like okay so in this coordinate system we get this result but in another coordinate system that is let's say how much how uh, what will be the fringe shift in this coordinate system what is going to happen in another coordinate system uh, because we don't know where which coordinate system where uh, these detectors are and so on but actually it does not matter the the we we use the most convenient coordinate system so that it is sort of related to that question of time and uh, space and then the observables we predict are independent of coordinates so for example uh, uh, how much fringe is going to shift in a detector is, a, is an absolute question it has nothing to do with coordinates in any coordinate system it will be the same okay another question what is the theoretical reason for the mass gap is not known uh, that it's just that uh, the neutron stars which have been observed which were observed so far were sort of up to uh, uh, two solar masses and the black holes which were observed were above five solar masses so these two to five solar mass uh, nothing was observed before that's a, that is the main thing so that is why if, if suppose we had observed lot of neutron star uh, in the, uh, up to uh, three solar masses then when this uh, new source was found then we could confidently say this is probably a neutron star but since we do, did not observe anything there we don't know what exactly it is uh, so that's that's the reason uh, okay I, i don't think theoretically there if there are the theoretical uh, boundary that neutron star cannot be uh, more than two solar masses or something or black holes cannot be less than three solar masses 
if there was something like that then we could i think we could be more confident and kind of start saying that okay this must be a black hole or a neutron star okay now moving forward so this here is the picture of you see that there are there's a whole frequency band in gravitational waves is full of different sources which are shown with this shaded region for example uh, uh, here this this red one is compact binary uh, coalescences it's marked somewhere in spiral is marked then there are core collapse supernovae here although so it is not that we are going to detect all of this meaning at least now maybe in future we will be uh, uh, then there, then there are the pulsars which are the spinning neutron stars then if you go to lower frequencies you see that supermassive black hole uh, binaries would be something which people would look forward to and they, they maybe one may be able to see it with this pulsar timing array uh, then there is a stochastic background created by those and then there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, this part primordial background which also exists then in the mid frequencies there are extreme mass ratio in spirals where the, the, a super a small stellar mass black hole may be going around a supermassive black hole and all things like that so all those things are there and you see that there are these black lines which show different kind different uh, observatories and missions which have been proposed and people are working on those and so so you can see that the future is quite promising uh, so far i mean right now we are observing only in um, in this uh, atavans ligo band somewhere here and with uh, limited to only this frequency bands so we are and we have only observed like few dots here like uh, meaning few transients so there is this whole window a whole set of windows are remaining okay so ideally what we want to do is something like this so uh, these are the picture of the sky pictures of the sky in different um, electromagnetic bands starting from radio that is from lower frequencies to uh, gamma rays okay so this is like as you can see the sky looks very different in very different uh, frequency bands ideally we would like to do that with gravitational waves also but we just don't uh, uh, have the technology right now and that, that is what we have to look forward to in the future right now we have some transients in this band that's what i was talking about and then so we, to reach from this to this could take decades to maybe even 100 years okay and just to in another words that we are here and we this is where we have to go it's a long path it took 400 years for electromagnetic astronomy but then technology uh, can evolve faster and then we know already a lot from electromagnetic astronomy and so on so maybe uh, progress can be slightly faster but then we'll have to wait okay so the for, so what are the uh, what people are actually working on for this transition to the next generation and so on so this was the initial ligo which did not detect anything as i mentioned the only 2% chance of detection was there and this was initial vargo then uh, this this operated i till 2005 then for the next 10 years they were upgraded to the second generation detectors which are advanced ligo and advanced vargo this is the target sensitivity you have not reached that completely yet uh, especially in the lower frequencies so this is and then there will be ligo india also somewhere with slightly upgraded frequency somewhere here uh, this will be uh, so this is where we are right now and lot of science can be done with this but then since these detectors took decades basically this took 20 years uh, almost to make and then this is 10 more years and then we are hoping that the the next generation third generation detectors that is einstein telescope cosmic explorer will probably take uh, 20 more years so you have to start the work right now and that is the main aim you have to find land because these are proposed to be very long detectors so finding uh, flat land is not so easy going underground increases the cost 
so all kinds of things are there so we have to uh, uh, basically people have started now not we have to people have started uh, already for for einstein telescope site surveys have been done for a cosmic explorer initial funding has been received uh, a, a lot of uh, development is going on so what we expect to see with this so here is a nice way to look at this so again these are the uh, this is the current sensitivity sort of okay maybe a little more here and this was the target sensitivity which we have not reached yet and this will be a plus sensitivity where uh, ligo india will be and this is cosmic explorer factor of almost 10 difference so what it means that factor of 10 difference actually means factor of 1000 improvement in the detection volume so that we will be able to detect at least 1000 times more sources in fact uh, more than that because the, even the bandwidth also increases it is not just uh, the sensitivity in the in this region increases you see that here this band also goes quite a bit close to a uh, uh, few hertz so right now let's say we are here and we are obs we observed in this uh, region till the second observing run of ligo for and probably with uh, when ligo india comes online with all the detectors we will reach this part a plus this green circle here and sort of green circle this green dashed here so what happens is that that means we may be able to see quite a bit few black hole binary mergers with the current uh, uh, with a plus but then as you can see there are uh, mergers going on up to quite a far away distance and then the neutron stars are almost not uh, remained untouched for the whole dense region and this is the these are the uh, binaries which are going to tell us about hubble constant because this can be followed up the black holes don't emit any electromagnetic counterpart so so there is this whole bunch of things remaining plus there could be sources beyond binaries those things are also there so it is quite uh, so you can see that we are right now in a very quiet place in the uh, universe we have observed only in the region which is almost empty we, i mean our reach was very much limited and why it is in, uh, increasing is not because we are in some special position of the universe it is simply because the universe was much denser at earlier epochs that is at higher redshift see this is redshift 1 this is redshift 2 so each of these circles represent one redshift okay so here is a question um, uh, again you should ask the question to everyone so that other people can also see your question uh, why are characteristic lines that is various detectors in strain noise versus frequency plot well that is the uh, best way to see it right i mean this is it is anyway frequency dependent so you have to show the frequency and uh, the strain noise is it means that you cannot detect anything below uh, that strain noise meaning the strain that you can detect has to be higher than that and since in gravitational waves we are measuring strain not just power that gives us the advantage uh, because if you were uh, detecting power it would uh, the the fall would be much faster it will be one by r square rather this is uh, since it is amplitude is one by r so that is the main reason yeah okay so this is how the, the, this these are some uh, sort of fantasy <laughs> because the, nothing is uh, completely concrete but this is a plan for the einstein telescope uh, in, in europe this will be a 10 km arm length uh, detector uh, this uh, of this triangular shape 100 to 200 meter underground and um, the sensitivity will be one order of magnitude better than that is 10 times better than the present uh, advanced ligo detectors this is one of the designs um, there is a chance that this is what is going to uh, i mean something similar will be implemented so that's uh, 
that is a possibility now what i told you in the last class is that somebody asked about uh, seismic noise uh, that uh, why seismic noise is there in lower frequency and i said that that is how it is that seismic noise is higher at lower frequencies so if we want to detect lower frequency sources we have to go to space now this is one of those detectors uh, uh, which is uh, called lisa uh, okay there is a question let me see uh, the question okay let me first play this video then you will see how it goes so it is basically a set of three uh, space crafts which will exchange uh, laser light and uh, then follow the earth okay and that's uh, that's how basically the idea is to measure the fluctuations in their distance uh, due to gravitation waves and this is another way to do it and you will see how exactly it is done yeah uh, okay oh your hand is down so uh, if you still have the questions please let me know okay yeah so this is the plan Hello, sir. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, actually, I was planning this question for a long time. I forgot to ask you before. Like, uh, what are the constraints that, uh, per, that like, uh, shortlisted our LISA satellites into three, and why not four or more than that? Uh, money. If you have money, then you can build any number. If you build anything less than three, then it is useless because... Exactly, the three helps in localization of the point. Not yeah, that is one part. Also, you need uh, two independent detectors to uh, make a uh, s proper claim for a detection. Uh, if you have one detector, then if you detect something, how will you know that this is noise and uh, this is not noise? But if you when you have three, you can form independent sort of baselines to confirm that these are this is the. I mean, you can form basically three baselines, let's say, and if three are detecting the same things or two of them are independent then uh, you can say that okay this is this is a real signal so will this three be on the same position or will they just rotate on respect to their axis like uh, in the form they are, of triangle they are all in the in Keplerian orbit See, these are all freely falling that is freely falling meaning they are going around the sun just following the earth so this is that this animation shows you that you see that what what is so this is how they are going to go. The Earth is going around the Sun, and these three satellites are just going to follow the Earth. There will be small micro thrusters which can slightly change their positions, and that they have to do to create something called the drag-free environment, uh, so that they don't want to. Okay, I'll tell you what exactly it is. So this is the thing. Yeah, is it, that was your question, right? Exactly. Exactly. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. There is one more question. Go ahead. Yeah. So my question is related to Junik's question uh, in an extension that if we have three satellites for LISA, then how do we get more than one baseline? Uh, so, so see, two, two satellites, so you, you can imagine, so there are total six uh, links, okay. All of them uh, are independent in some sense, but you know that the positions of... So you have uh, each of these uh, laser lines. So initial uh, uh, initial plan was that there will be uh, each one of the satellites will send laser to both the uh, satellites and then also receive from uh, both of them. So there will be six links. But I think because of fund constraint, okay, this is not completely clear yet. Uh, there will be now um, total four links. Uh, one, two, three, four links, yeah. Now, the point here is that even with one arm, you could detect gravitation waves. See, you don't need, even with a single, I, I told you in the, this thing right, yesterday, that even with single uh, baseline, I mean, two, two uh, uh, right, uh, meaning two meters, you can detect gravitation waves. Just that there will be more noise sources, which you would not be able to cancel. That is one part. The other part is that if you have only one, then there is the noise part, right? I mean, how would you cancel the noise? Now, what people have done, they have 
mathematically shown that from this, uh, that this something called time delay interferometry, using that, you can form independent uh, combinations, linear combinations, which can give you basically independent measurements of gravitational waves. So that will uh, sort of uh, uh, help you in cancelling the uh, noise. It's like cancelling or you, you have to have confidence in detection. That's the thing. And then people have shown with uh, simulations. I don't know exactly what happens if you remove one of the arms, which has been done now. But uh, I guess that is also fine. Meaning you see that one arm it does not have any link right now. Yes, so but uh, in LIGO, uh, generally we have two arms uh, so that noise reduction happens and then the other LIGO is placed at a different dis location so as to make sure that uh, the signal is actually not noise but there is a correlation between the two detectors. That in is true. That is true. So uh, that I understand that but the thing is that LIGO is slightly different because it is on the earth. Okay, When you go to space, uh, it, it will be the things will be slightly different uh, the thing is that okay i have to check exactly if there are uh, people are expecting glitches there in in uh, lisa i mean for example in ligo there are uh, you know a train passing by or uh, some uh, uh, earthquake somewhere those things will matter here that may not matter the main thing is that you have to somehow cancel the laser frequency noise which also is can uh, gets cancelled in LIGO because of this uh, particular uh, combination. But here the thing is that uh, uh, if you... Uh, so, okay, so let me tell you something more. So there are more detectors, I will show you later, uh, which are planned with, with a set of constellations. So there will be two, set, six satellites, okay, not three. That is being planned. That is one part. Second thing is that it is not just LISA which is going to fly. There is one more Chinese mission that is also aimed for the same time, which is called Tianqing. Now, the question is that whether uh, there will be some noise source which can create a... Uh, as, okay, one more thing. So what LISA is going to observe is our very long duration signals. That is, the, the signals can last for, uh, so see, the uh, signal band is millihertz. That means the period is hours. Okay. So there may not be any such kind of uh, glitches, which is, uh, which will be present there. But on the other hand, if you have just two, uh, then it may be very uh, tricky to, uh, uh, I don't think you can actually cancel the laser frequency noise. You would not be able to cancel the, uh, whatever, the laser frequency or phase noise uh, that way. So you need, main thing would be to cancel that noise I, because there is no ground motion. But I have to check that whether there, 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 there are any other issues here which will be like LIGO, that you need absolutely two LIGOs to uh, detect it. Okay, now moving on. So, so what has ha happened with LISA? So, uh, there was a LISA Pathfinder mission which was uh, launched in uh, uh, 2015. And uh, basically the idea is that, that there is a, that we, we want to have these test masses, that is the mirrors sort of in LIGO, uh, free so that they can move when gravitational waves come. Now, if the spacecraft, if the that test mass is attached to the spacecraft, then uh, there is a problem because uh, then it is not completely free. But then how do you keep the test mass in the spacecraft? So basically what has to be done is that the spacecraft has to keep a distance from the, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, test mass by sensing it in such a way that the sensing process does not perturb it. So this was a challenge and then, uh, and then the spacecraft has to sort of uh, uh, maintain distance with micro thrusters and so on and so on. So this was uh, very, uh, this passed the test very well. Uh, in fact, okay, I will skip this one. I can show this one. 
this was the requirement for lisa pathfinder this is a noise budget that how much noise can be allowed if lisa pathfinder could satisfy this requirement lisa main lisa mission would be funded that is this will be a technology demonstrator but not only lisa pathfinder uh, uh, satisfied this requirement it actually satisfied the requirement for it did better than even lisa itself so this was lisa's requirement and this was the actual uh, measured noise which was way better than anything expected and then people had no doubt what so doubt whatsoever that uh, that this technology is viable okay so what will lisa tell us so what one of the important thing there are many things of course that one of the important thing is that um, it will be able to predict the binary mergers in ligo band that is uh, it, it, so the binaries which are merging in ligo band are in spiraling at a lower frequency so lisa can see them and then in uh, in the in the scale of like years to uh, let's say weeks it will be able to say uh, when the merger is going to happen however as you can imagine if there was a detector here in this band that process would have been much uh, faster that is we would know much sooner when a merger is going to happen and there are plans for that also ha huh, so how so there is a question that uh, okay there are more questions okay let me see Uh, does not the motion of the satellites affect the signal detection and how they reduce the noise like slower fares etc so all those things were that is what the purpose of the uh, the pathfinder mission was to show that uh, th this acceleration noise this noise in the spacecraft satellites do not affect the signal because it is ultimately detached from the uh, from the uh, main um, uh, from the test masses but then of course some some noise get transmitted because you are const constantly measuring the separation and how it next question is how complicated to keep lisa stable without perturbation with outside objects so there has been lot of work including in ayuka uh, uh, by sanjeev durandar and so on so they showed that if you keep the uh, plane of the satellite at 60 degrees in that orientation which is shown that uh, the right. so this angle okay if you make it uh, i think it is 060 degrees then the satellite would not uh, th this configuration would be more stable than any other configuration so this is the thing so th you can then rotate on this plane also so this is this is one axis then it rotates so that is it is a three dimensional picture is there so people have worked on this that how to make things more stable etc okay now there is one more interesting thing that can happen uh, with lisa is that so this is a nice simulation which was done by steve drusk and so on to show what happens when a small black hole falls in a bigger black hole so you watch till the end and let me know if you don't hear the sound because the sound is important and you see here it says days before march and again the amplitude and frequency both increases so you see that the, this box is going to rear just uh, the, the the black hole orbit is shrinking so it is going to reduce the sound what happens is that the sound suddenly stopped and that is because the smaller black hole entered the bigger black hole and after that th there will be ring down signal which is very small because there is only a small perturbation on the um, black hole but 
suddenly, of course, the black hole cannot fall inside the uh, horizon that I mean, in our frame, but then suddenly it gets infinitely redshifted and the signal stops. And that's a pretty interesting proof that there is there exists an event horizon. So these kind of things are expected. Okay, so more things. So uh, the, the, I did not talk much about the gravitational, that stochastic background, but there is a chance that a, uh, that even with the present detection detectors, a stochastic background, that is the distant binaries, distant compact binary coalescences, which create this smooth sort of background, uh, which can be detected. The thing here is that for different models, the background prediction is very different. So by measuring it, we will have different ideas about which of the astrophysical models are correct and so on. And this shows that about maybe in few years time, uh, with design sensitivity of LIGO, uh, advanced LIGO, there may be a three sigma detection and five sigma may be far away. Then the thing is that, the, so this is one of the things. So there are new sources people are exploring. So like we have explored these things. They see there are these ex, ex, uh, exoplanets. A lot of work is going on. Now, if we, if you see the total uh, amount of signal that is that can be created by exoplanets going around the stars, is like this, and this is LISA sensitivity curve. Now, already you saw that the, the, the LISA pathfinder already did pretty well, uh, better than LISA. So, if LISA sensitivity curve comes here or with a future detector, we may be able to see this. And that may be also good to see this, this background. This is the cosmological background. So they are of the same order. And this red one shows the background from, our, uh, from the uh, galactic and extragalactic extrasolar planets. The yellow one is uh, galactic, which is, uh, uh, no, so the yellow one is ex extragalactic and these this ones are, uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm saying the wrong thing. This is the, the red one is the Milky Way, yeah, they, they are because the because of the proximity that is the closest one, yeah, and this one is for uh, Andromeda. These things. So, in in principle, we will observe the sum of this, but then since this is a log plot, this would not matter much. So the red ones may be able we may be able to detect. So that will be sort of like direct counting of uh, exoplanets. Okay, there is one more question. Was two polarizations were here simultaneously. The cube uh, will contract and expand equally. But here, this oscillation is complicated. No, this is just th that showed the orbit of the of the black hole. That animation only showed the orbit. It's not the gravitational amplitude was plotted below. And it is, it is going around in such a way that it's, all the polarizations will be there. It is not like a single plane motion. Okay. Okay, so moving forward. So what is the broad picture right now? See, this is the, our, this is the picture of the, uni, uh, of the history of the universe that we think uh, is correct. There are a lot of observations on this side. And this is cosmic microwave background. Unfortunately, all these things on this left side, left because we don't have a direct proof of anything like this. So the task would be to directly get some signal from this side, and that and the the stochastic background. This could be the could be one of the some signatures also on the cosmic microwave background polarization. So that will be one way to look at it. But there will be possibly, there can be direct detections also. I briefly mentioned that. And also, you know, there are gaps in cosmology, as I mentioned, that the, this whole cosmic pie, we, we only know part of the ordinary matter and everything else is unknown right now. Here, for example, this is the same thing that uh, inflation. You see, if you plot the... Uh, expansion of the universe this time, and you will see that this is kind of the uh, current expansion rate. A large portion of the uh, expansion happened during cosmic uh, inflation. 
And again, we have no proof of that. I mean, it is even though it sounds like a very short time, it's a significant part of the expansion actually happened here. So there are major gaps here, so which has to be filled, and that is you, that is where many of the future res researchers uh, will work on. And of course, people recognize this, and there are all kinds of experiments which is going to try to probe this inflationary gravitational wave background. Uh, we don't have any mission here. There was this mission which is called Big Bang Observer, which was proposed. And again, because of funding and so on, this thing is, of course, uh, not in the horizon anymore. But there is something called the DeSigo mission. Uh, so Big Bang Observer could, would be like this, that there will be multiple set of uh, constellations of satellites uh, to observe. This one, the funding is being pursued. It's not yet fun, fully funded, but an initial DCGO mission, it's called DCHARS Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, may get funded. And uh, initially, there may be only one arm which will fly, later on three, and then maybe at some point a constellation of this arm. This will be more like a LIGO on, in space, but with three arms, like uh, there will be a real kind of interferometer there, sort of like Einstein telescope. Okay, so coming back to our current uh, aims. Um, so our present aim would be to, first thing would be to get LIGO India operating because we, we, we talked about several decades scale. So now let's come back to the near term goal of let's say about five years, where uh, the first thing would be to get our LIGO India so that we can do very basic things of localizing uh, sources and follow up. So th these are, you see, this is the sphere and these are the inner circles of some of the detections with two detectors, okay? And you see that as soon as Vargo detector was online, the inner circle reduced significantly. Even this is pretty big, but it's a pretty big reduction. And if during the first detection, LIGO India was online, the inner circle would shrink from this green to this small thing. And that would be very much important. And this is another three detector detection. That is 2017 onwards, you see that the error circle have reduced when three detectors were able to observe. So, but we need even further reduction. And this is because of this reason that with two satellites, you can only locate something on a ring on the sky. That is, these are the ring, those rings. They are cut because the because of the antenna pattern function. That is the detectors are not um, able to see every direction equally well. That's why there is a some partial thing. So it's somehow, somewhat the disadvantage that detectors cannot see all the directions come to an advantage of uh, localizing the sky. But that is actually obviously a bad thing. I mean, it's not, it, it's a, it's a uh, two negatives making it positive sort of thing. So uh, if we had three detectors, then we could uh, uh, see it. We could see the, I mean, we could localize the source very well. And that's why we need three. In fact, probably preferably LIGO India is that this is actually the earth seen from the pole. This is the pole. This is America. This is India. Uh, this, this this part is India. And you can see that the distance between two LIGO detectors right now is like 10 milliseconds. That is 3000 kilometers. With Vargo, it is a bit more. And if, when there is LIGO India, there will be three more baselines compared to three right now. And two of them will be very long. Okay, so that will give us quite a bit of uh, a high resolution. And also, as I said, the, 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 there is a chance that the sensitivity of the LIGO India detector will be comparable to the two other uh, LIGO detectors, which, is, uh, which will be pretty uh, significantly Big, big, uh, good advantage. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so these baselines would they be penetrating through the earth, or would they are they calculated on the surface? No, this is through the earth, but there is no actual baseline. I mean, it is it is just the distance. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so have to sit on the earth. That's all. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so this is another way to look at it that uh, that the, the area of these uh, triangles from bright uh, with three detectors increase significantly when you include uh, LIGO India. Okay, anyway, so coming back, so what is the ultimate result of this? 
that if you had this uh, Hanford, two detectors in Hanford, one Livingston and one in Vargo, then the error circles will be this big on the sky. And they are basically, for most part of the sky, they, you cannot follow them up with electromagnetic telescopes because they are the, it will take probably, I don't know, weeks to cover. And then you, by the time you reach the, cover the whole uh, uh, error circle, the source has died long back because the source is not going to stay for a very long time. So you need a very small localization to actually observe the uh, immediate uh, emissions. And with LIGO India, this becomes the picture, much smaller error circles on the sky. And then it will be, it is still much bigger than the moon, by the way. This will be like 20 degrees or so on. The moon is, uh, uh, what, one degree diameter, I guess. So it's much, much smaller, bigger than that. So you can see that in principle, we should have even smaller error circle. Now yesterday, so there, then somebody was asking that how, uh, that the, the, about the, Location of LIGO India, uh, so so that so the pri primary site right now is uh, near Hingoli uh, in Maharashtra, which is not here, and these are the sort of earthquake zones. So this is in a low seismic activity region, one of the lowest. Even though seismic earthquakes are not a uh, uh, big issue, the thing is that the detector only thing is that the detector goes out of lock for. Uh, uh, that is the resonance goes away and then you have to bring back the resonance etc for it will take some time one hour or maybe few hours but the main thing is that the constant activity should be low so the detector has to be the site should be chosen such that uh, of course you don't want to get into a full uh, really size, size earth, high earthquake zone it has to be as low as possible but th that is already you see main, a large portion of india is already like that now, the thing is that it has to be far away from uh, locality so that the, the, the noise sources are much less, that is vehicle moving and so on. So the daytime, nighttime noise in LIGO varies quite a bit, also the weekend noise and so on. But, but then it should be accessible. That is, if the airport, there is no nearby airport, then it is a big problem because how will the uh, foreign scientists visit that place and these are all international collaboration i mean you cannot do anything alone uh, many countries together only can uh, do things so uh, the, all these considerations led to some of the sites which were shortlisted and then uh, this so right now the uh, uh, best place and there are many other parameters like uh, rainfall uh, uh, wind etc and so on uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, by this requirement, the sites will be slightly difficult to leave at, it's, it's, it's like either too hot, no water, etc. Because if it was otherwise, then people would be living there. Uh, okay, there is a question. Will LIGO India be internationally sponsored project or funded by India only project? LIGO India is, is funded by uh, the Department of Atomic Energy and uh, Department of Science and Technology together. However, some of the there is an MOU with the uh, National uh, uh, Science Foundation, NSF basically, here of the US. Uh, uh, so some of the components uh, of the optical components of uh, LIGO, uh, so there was a plan for two LIGO detectors at Hanford, but then at some point people realize that two detectors the same side does, does not make sense because of correlated noise. So those components will be given to India, but the, uh, so which are also expensive, but the main uh, expenses of the vacuum tube, uh, installing the detectors, maintaining it, running it, all those things will be uh, uh, done by uh, India. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, I mean, it is the, the, the challenge is like you get the components, uh, but then how do you install and then make sure that it reaches the desired sensitivity is a, it's a huge uh, research challenge. I mean, you can probably the crudest example is that uh, I suppose somebody, you, you order a laptop and then somebody sends you all the parts and said that the manual has not been written yet. Yeah. Uh, so now, can you please assemble? So it will be very similar to that because there is no manual for a, a gravity wave detector, how to make that. 
it is only through experience you have to do it and also uh, each site is different even though there are two detectors in ligo you would think that they must be identical but they are not because it it it's all I mean, you find a noise source in each detector and then you have to come up with an idea of how to uh, deal with it um, okay so the thing is that of course the, the motivation there is a scientific motivation of uh, this kind astronomical motivation of observer and so on which is which is a, a big driver but then uh, this kind of projects also provide a platform it's a multidisciplinary project so different expertise from different fields can come together and uh, exchange knowledge which then makes it possible to make different detectors not necessarily uh, or different projects not necessarily gravitation waves uh, so somebody is asking okay there is a question that will a gw detector set up on the moon be better will cost be deter be the determining factor of course i mean i think uh, there are proposals for setting up a detector in the moon but uh, you know you have to uh, see that uh, uh, after the full installation also it takes years by hundreds of people to actually operate the detector at the right sensitivity now that is partly because there are there is movement on the earth on the moon the movement is not there and there is no atmosphere and all those things are there but one has to see only time will tell us that uh, how you can uh, if there is a detector in the moon uh, how expensive it is going to be to carry all the required uh, uh, components to the moon uh, vacuum may not be necessary that is a good advantage but then also making it work and so on may take some time so it is it is only a matter of time so so of course when you are doing the first detector it cannot be on the moon be simply because uh, the the whole process of uh, building a detector is a learning process every moment you learn and every component reducing the noise in every component of the or sub system of the detector is at least uh, it's more than one phd so you see that is a very complicated process so because we are trying to measure distances of smaller than the size of a proton effectively it's a it's very uh, any small thing i mean it, it, it people have to break their head to find out that why there is some extra noise for example for the last 5 years there is some extra noise in the lower frequencies of ligo which is preventing us from uh, reaching the full sensitivity and nobody knows what is causing it different things have been are being tried if such a thing happens in the moon then i don't know how people are going to uh, sort that out but then on, on the positive side there are chances of different noise sources are less in the moon so maybe it will be easier to uh, debug okay so the, the, so how do we build this platform of people to you know exchange ideas and so on so this ayuka is uh, playing a, a lead role there so it's it's basically organizing it was organizing these meetings called ligo india the road ahead uh, uh, meetings where uh, researchers from very uh, prominent uh, institutions from india would take part and then they will say that what is their capabilities and then Uh, what is and then some people will say that what is required for ligo india and see how people can contribute etc but of course because of this pandemic etc uh, all these things are uh, slowing has was slowed down but let, let's see how it uh, uh, improves uh, in the future again and also you need uh, quite a high performance computing facilities there for for uh, ligo data analysis and uh, so those things have also have been set up here at ayuka so this one of the uh, uh, so uh, fastest supercomputers are here so which uh, uh, meaning in in india and of course these are not like one shot installation they they get continuously upgraded in phases and so these things are also useful and then there is lot of machine learning and so on which which are the current technology and we have to use them because that we believe uh, galileo success was related to, was because of the fact that he used the latest technology for astronomy and that's what we have to do so this is one of my students made this uh, 
so he used machine learning for very different uh, kinds of uh, systems and so on. So if you are enthusiastic, then there is a lot of things you can do. And so, okay, I will uh, basically uh, stop here. So, uh, so the detection started a new era in astronomy, but there is a long way to go. And there is huge amount of effort going on in every part of it, developing detectors, uh, uh, sensitivity, uh, analysis techniques, signal models, so that you can do batch filtering better, etc. And uh, so our current plan, of course, is to first thing would be to get LIGO India done. But in the future, there will be uh, many different avenues, space-based detectors, etc. There is a pulsar timing array already. Uh, there is an Indian pulsar timing array uh, uh, group who, which is uh, going to detect, uh, which is uh, whose aim is to detect gravitational waves uh, using uh, stable pulsars. Uh, I think yesterday I, uh, somebody asked about pulsar glitches. So basically these pulsars, when you observe the pulsars very uh, well, then if there is a gravitational waves which is passing by, you would be able to see a small glitch in the pulsar, not in one pulse, by observing one pulsar, but looking at the correlations between these glitches in different pulsars, one would be able to uh, detect the gravitational waves. So all those things are going on. So hopefully, so there will be, uh, we'll learn much more from uh, gravitational wave astronomy, like in, after uh, Galileo's astronomy. Okay, so I will stop here. So there is a video which was made some long time ago uh, when we were just talking about LIGO India. In uh, So it was done in Caltech. Uh, uh, if you, uh, so I can actually share the link here instead of playing it here. In your off time, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, play the video. Okay, I stop here. Now questions. Okay, there are no other questions, it seems. Um, okay, so there is a, okay, it, it is better if you share the presentation with us and thank you. Yeah, okay, I will certainly uh, share the PDF. Uh, it's, it's, it, there is everything which is uh, there uh, in the, in the internet. Uh, but yeah, I will share this uh, PDF. Does uh, yeah. so the, the question is that does gravitational wave affect the atomic clocks readings? I, I think there was some discussion that whether we can detect uh, gravitational waves by uh, looking at the atomic clocks, but I'm not sure what was the conclusion. I think it is difficult uh, because. Uh, what exactly you will observe is not very clear. Of course, LIGO detectors have atomic clocks to, for synchronization because otherwise you would not uh, be able to, uh, 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 I mean, the, the, the timings have to be very uh, perfect so that uh, we can do cross correlation and all those things. Okay, I'll just see if there is this uh, video, if I can find out. This is the one. So this is, I, I shared this video every year because this was also done by the summer school students. And you may also enjoy this. 
Ah, okay. Uh, okay, there are more questions. Do gravitational waves undergo redshift? Yes, they do. They, they do. Uh, so, uh, uh, gravitational waves have all the see, properties very similar to uh, uh, electro, uh, electromagnetic waves. So they uh, they have lensing, they go through redshift and everything. Okay. Okay. So the thing is that those who are interested in working on projects on gravitational waves, I think you send a mail and we may be able to redirect you to a, a person who is nearby and so on, because it may be much easier for you to, in this pandemic situation, it is all, doing completely online is also possible, but I don't know how effective that is. And, uh, but anyway, if you are interested, you can send and then uh, we, we can see how to do. But then say that you start the mail by saying that you are in summer school and then uh, this thing, because we receive a lot of mail, so it uh, it's can get difficult to, respond sometimes. Uh, uh, other than, in, wait, other than interferometry, can there be any other technologies to detect gravitational? There are many other technologies which are explored, uh, but I think those are also interferometry, some atom in interferometry and so on. Of course, the bar detector is one which is not interferometry, uh, but it's not clear to me whether there is any, uh, significant progress in these alternatives. And the advantage of interferometry is that you can actually, uh, so there is whatever source you use, let's say laser source, you can, there will be some noise. In interferometry, what happens is that, especially in this Michelson kind of setup, uh, the common noise ca gets canceled out. The, there is the, the beam splitter, from the beam splitter, the same noise actually comes back and then they cancel out only the difference remains. So that, that is a big advantage there. Uh, okay, then the question is that are the LIGO detectors online all the time or else how do we understand when to look for it? LIGO detectors are supposed to be online all the time, but many times they are not because of upgrades, uh, maintenance, uh, some earthquake came, etc. So when the detector is not online, we lose the data. That's all. But then ideally, if we have that, that is one of the primary reasons for having multiple detectors, because only with three detectors, you would be able to detect, uh, uh, localize a source. But the probability that a detector is up is about 70%. That means if you have only three detectors, you can see that the probability that all three are up is less than, is like half. That is, is less than half. Uh, it is 0.7 cube. That is, uh, I think, 0.35 or something. Even if you take 80% uptime, that is really pushing it, it will be half. It's like 0.512. So the thing is that if there are five detectors, then the chances of two de three detectors online is much higher. Now, the, there is this question. Okay, this is a common question that can undergraduate students uh, join such type of research? Uh, so my personal advice is that for undergraduate students should not commit um, to anything too soon. You should, but you should, but you should explore quite a bit. That is, you know, every everything that you see in these kind of uh, summer school lectures, uh, many times at least in my lectures, you only see the the good things of like what is the the, the attractive parts, but. In real life, there is quite a bit of uh, uh, mess involved. Okay, so uh, I think that the best example is the sports car business. Many people like sports car, but the but when you are making it, you have to deal with a lot of grease and uh, uh, dirty stuff. This is true in any field. Now, what you should try to look for is but the outcome, the final outcome is of course very important that, uh, the, that you should be attracted to the final outcome, but then that may be true for many different fields. So you have to see what kind of mess you are, uh, you can 
uh, you will be able to uh, deal with in the sense that first you have to be capable to carry out those uh, messy things and the second is that you have to like it also so in gravitational wave research a lot of time you have to just uh, sit in front of computer and do number crunching okay use python codes to do this that etc at some point you may get bored but then you may get bored in doing something else also so you have to see what exactly is is that that where the uh, the in where the time you are spending the the doing something boring you would be able to cope with it because the final outcome you will like so much so that outcome this this balance you have to do and that is why it is important for young students to explore different projects and to figure out what you like nothing will be perfect you will never find anything that i mean it is very i think it will be difficult to find something which is which will meet your expectations perfectly but then you may always try to find you will may always get something which is better than the others and that would be i think uh, uh, something to look for okay i will come to the uh, hand up little okay this since there are many questions i'll just see uh, is it possible so now for the bsc okay more concretely for bsc students yes there are it is possible to do projects there are different kinds of projects which people at ayuk ayuk has a big team ligo uh, india team which is working on uh, this kind of things and then based on your expertise the projects are offered um, even online so that is the short response but then i was i am trying to be more careful so that you don't end up wasting time in this pandemic like situations where things are a bit difficult uh, now the thing is that ayuk of Uh, faculty members can only offer phd projects through the normal process of you get admitted to a phd program and that is highly recommended because then you are uh, you have much more uh, control on your life that you are not uh, funded by a specific person or a project and things like that that is one of the important thing you should uh, try out if that does not work out because it does not work out for many people because competitive exams is it has its own um, uh, problems so many people cannot do well there so in that case you should find alternatives i mean there no, no system is perfect so uh, competitive exams work for some people but don't work for some people so that is also another problem the usual uh, for part general projects of course there is the procedure is to get into um, uh, uh, apply for uh, the the ayuka program i think you all have applied so that is the usual procedure there is this vacation students program also which is not happening because i think doing a project online when you are sort of undergraduate student is not may not be that appealing it is not just the interaction with the guide exactly for about the technical stuff that matters i mean it is also interacting with other people who are working in the institute uh, having lunch with them all those things actually uh, add together to give you a full flavor of uh, what it is so uh, but anyway so that is I, we are hope we hoping that the situation will improve soon um then the question is that uh, uh, so if you can you so those who are interested yeah i mean if you are looking for projects etc you can feel free to send us a mail we will forward you to the right person or we will see what can be done uh, with that i mean most many times we don't have much time but our phd students can help you uh, the observational time for dww events drastically increases as we look at higher frequency regimes uh, can we get around this problem by reducing the observational time observation time ha huh, it increases at lower frequencies lower the frequency higher the observation time so supermassive black hole mergers require more time to observe because the frequency is much lower uh, so you you cannot reduce the observation time it's then the signal to noise ratio will go down so that's the problem okay mm. so the thing is that ha huh, there somebody is asking about the grf so the, the thing is that you can apply for uh, there is this joint entrance screening test where uh, uh, 
BTEC in, in different engineering streams can take, uh, apply. And then many of our PhD students are engineers. Uh, and uh, Ayuka does take those students. I mean, they can, you can register. Um, uh, uh, Ayuka will take care of registration if you are an Ayuka student. I mean, that is, if you can uh, come through the, the, the standard Ayuka, uh, standard channels, that is JAST or uh, uh, the INAT, that is Ayuka, NCRA, uh, admission days, etc. Uh, those things we, we can, uh, that, that is possible. Um, I think you can look at the Ayuka's web page. Yeah, there is a section where uh, there is a student's program and you will get all the information there. Uh, yeah. Hi, yeah. Sorry, this is Santosh. Hi, Santosh. So actually this kind of question, we have a one uh, special seminar, uh, uh, sorry, say, session uh, this uh, today after the, uh, at the three o'clock. Ah, okay, great. So then they can, then people can all ask there the questions there. The possibility of the, uh, like, getting in the astronomy astrophysics uh, uh, area okay great so then that, that is the best place to ask because then the, you can uh, uh, get more informed answers also that what will be the exact channel and how to do it. around 330 330 to 430 okay okay let me just see if there are any other uh, what kind of theoretical development is going on with research of gravitation i will answer that let me just check one more thing um, Okay, gravit okay, fine. So these questions are relevant. So I'll just go do this thing. Just one second. Uh, there are so lessons which provide theoretical and practical astronomers. Mm. Okay, so the thing is that generally, I will tell you that there are a lot of theoretical uh, activities going on uh, with gravitational waves. We, it, it is right now the, the searches that we are doing are highly limited. For example, uh, we, we assume that the spins of the black holes are aligned with the orbital angular momentum. Of course, that's that's that need not be true. But the problem is that the the, uh, the computation cost does not allow us to go beyond that. Then there are all kinds of approximations which we have to use right now because the full waveform which you get after numerical simulations, you can get it for one or two. But then if we have to get it, get this what is called model way from the templates for two uh, nearly a million uh, parameters parameter uh, sets basically the combination of masses spin etc it's not possible right now i mean th there are all kinds of theoretical activities research which has to be which is required for to do that then there are these higher harmonics we are considering only the uh, quadrupole uh, these things right now but if you want to go to higher harmonics they, they, they give more uh, uh, information about the sources you can disentangle different de break these different degeneracies etc parameter degeneracies all those possibilities are there then the even just to detect the signal is is, is basically a mathematical problem because it is not just that computers will uh, See, computers have to be told to do something, and computers are important. But ultimately, you have to write the, come up with a mathematical uh, framework which you will fit to the computers. And those are all uh, uh, theoretical. Um, even computation is itself is uh, theoretical. I mean, not just uh, instrumentation. Now, the thing is that what that, that since LIGO is like is a project of very you know broad. Uh, 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 like a multidisciplinary uh, project, different kinds of expertise are needed in this project. So if you have some expertise, you should talk to one of the experts to see how your expertise fit, can fit in, uh, in the project and the person will be able to uh, direct you. I mean, you can also talk to... Uh, so the thing is that... Uh, 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 you have to send a mail to someone and then we can also redirect you. So uh, there are, there, even though it may look like there are not many institutes in India and so on, there are actually many people in India who are working on gravitation waves. And we may actually be able to tell you what who would be the closest person to you uh, geographically with whom you can uh, interact and find out more about how, whether you should do gravitation waves at all. That is one of the questions. 
and then uh, you so how you would be able to uh, uh, contribute and you can of course uh, take second opinion third opinion etc from uh, from different uh, people um so then uh, uh mentioned about alternative yeah so the alternatives are so sometimes uh, there are project positions that is um, uh let's say there will be there could be phd positions for ligo india even though we don't have any right now uh, there could be personal junior research fellowship uh, based on grants which we can uh, which sometimes are advertised uh, so then you have to look for those and if you talk to people uh, some, some of the people who are working in the in the field they can they may be able to tell you that okay this person may be having a grant and you can uh, talk to the person if the person can offer a gr of course there will be a full procedure even then there will be interviews etc but then uh, that that process will be more customized process rather than uh, going through the national level exams which are very generic okay uh, so we have to stop at some point okay there is a question that ew signals are short duration their original directions are not known so how do we decide the scanning in the sky yeah so the thing is that this is basically the related to this uh, uh picture that when three detectors detect a source by considering the time delay the thing is that the, the signals are coming almost at the same time but there are some millisecond order delays the maximum delay could be 10 milliseconds for the two ligo detectors because they are 3000 kilometers away so if a source is exactly on the along the line joining these two detectors then the one detector will get it at some point and the other maybe 10 milliseconds later so by combining this uh, few milliseconds delay you would be able to uh, point out from where the uh, so, uh, point out where the source is uh and then there is a the it will come with a error bar uh because the detectors are broad uh, they, they have broad antenna pattern they are de detecting from a large distance a large uh, angle on the sky so from that error bar you would be able to say that this is the the common area is the part from which where uh, the other uh, telescopes should observe okay the so second question here is that gw took a lot of time to get detected but later on many detections happened so what really changed the sensitivity of the detector you sort of figure out the mechanism no, uh, no the, yeah that the sensitivities were always improving it was improving even before detection but what happens is that uh, so in 2005 the chances of detection was 2% then when advanced ligo started operating even before officially started operating it was in the engineering mode testing mode it started detecting and then as the detectors uh, uh as time is progressing different upgrades are routinely being done that is why detectors are not taking data continuously there is this observing run etc that means basically the point is that after observing run one detector goes off for a, some time some upgrades are done then there there is observing run two and so on so these things are listed i mean if you do google search you will see that what are the uh, on ligo site they are mentioned that what are the upgrades they go on uh one aim is to increase the laser power then increase something called quantum squeezing where the error the the using uncertainty principle you can increase the uh, you want to you can reduce the phase noise at the cost of added amplitude noise and since we are more interested in the phase so that sort of helps us in reducing the noise even further and things like that so this is how it evolves but a lot of this technology is already the the blueprint is there it is just that you don't want to make too many changes at once because that will take very long time the, there will be no detection for a very long time and also you don't want to you first want to see whether something works and then uh, try another thing so this is how it, it is done in a, like in a staggered uh, manner okay i think there are no more questions so we will stop here now and uh, uh, you, you can uh, send a mail or you can uh, and of course you should uh, get uh, 
attend the questionnaire session then i'm not questionnaire that the, the the i think it is to be called career in astronomy session so and have you and ask your questions there and remember the final thing that explore many fields before committing to one field uh, but you should not take too much time and you should not uh, expect something perfect but still explore different things to see what suits you the best and that is the best advice i can give you those the people who become successful for them this match is more closer but nothing perfect okay all right thank you everyone and